First, a shout out to Lottie of Doom for suggesting this interesting case and a thank you to all of you for your support. Now, on with the video. On Monday the 24th of May 2010, Peter Gee, a caretaker at the Holmfield Court block of flats in Bradford in the UK, sat down to check the CCTV footage from over the weekend. What he saw would shock the nation and was something he's unlikely to ever forget. Checking the footage for the early hours of Saturday the 22nd of May 2010, he saw a man and a woman entering a flat. Minutes later, the woman was caught running for her life, being pursued by the man, who was armed with a crossbow. He then caught up with her, overpowered her, and dragged her back towards the front door of the flat. He then fired a crossbow bolt into her head, killing her, all in full view of the camera. The man then dragged the woman's body back into the flat. He then re-emerged, and this is what the camera caught. The man was Stephen Griffiths, a British serial killer who just killed his last victim. He ended the lives of at least three women between 2009 and 2010 and, when in court, proudly called himself the Crossbow Cannibal. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Stephen Sean Griffiths was born on December the 24th, 1969, in the market town of Dewsbury in West Yorkshire in the UK. He was the first of three children, to his mother Moira and his father, also called Stephen. The marriage broke down when Griffiths was 13, and the children of Moira moved into a council flat in the town of Wakefield. Griffiths' childhood was anything but normal, and it's clear he was exposed to extremely problematic behaviour which shaped his future crimes. Specifically, his mother Moira would leave the children alone most nights, going out whilst dressed provocatively, and she would return with different men each time. As one neighbour stated, quote, she would go out in the garden start naked and have sex with different men in full view of the neighbours. People would complain about it, but she didn't care. Her children, including Griffiths, would also witness this behaviour. Rumours circulated that Moira was a prostitute, and the ridicule from his classmates was something else that Griffiths had to deal with. In addition, Moira was also a criminal, and in 2007, she was convicted of falsely claiming £8,500 in benefits. In contrast, it appears his father Stephen tried to help his son, and saved every penny he could to send him to private school, specifically Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in Wakefield, where tuition is about £10,000 a year. As an aside, this is the same school where the Asses Bath murderer, John Haig, was educated before he went on to kill at least six people in the 1940s before dissolving their bodies in acid. Anyway, despite the prestigious education, it appears the damage had already been done, with Griffiths being described as a loner and strange by those who knew him. Griffiths appeared extremely socially awkward, had few friends and made no real attempt to become part of his school community, or any community for that matter. Instead, it appears that Griffiths, by the point he was a teenager, had devolved into his own little world, which revolved around a fascination with serial killers, violent films, weapons, martial arts and harming animals. Upon his eventual arrest, Griffiths was found in possession of hundreds of books related to serial killers, such as the Moors murderers, but he appeared to hold particular interest and reverence for the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, who murdered at least 13 women, mainly sex workers, between 1975 and 1980. Whilst at school, Griffiths was known to carry a knife in a briefcase and would frequently speak to his classmates about skinning birds and torturing animals. Griffiths spent three years at the school, leaving at age 16. I'll break here for a moment to highlight the red flags in this case, which were clear at a young age. So you have a man who clearly grew up in a neglectful household, likely not being exposed to appropriate social skills that he could mirror, who invariably had resentment, likely hatred towards his mother because of her abandonment of him and putting her own needs first and exposing him to inappropriate sexual activity and potentially being a prostitute or at least acting in this manner which led to him being ridiculed. This I believe led to a general hatred of women and particularly sex workers. 
In addition, his mother appeared happy to break the law and likely instilled these same values into her children. In response, Griffiths began to live in his own little world, revolving around violence, serial killers and weapons, all of which I believe represented power and recognition to him, with him perceiving that, in order to get the attention he craved as a child, acts of serious violence, including multiple acts of homicide, were the way to achieve it, to be noticed. It didn't take Griffiths long to start falling foul of the law, with his first conviction coming when he was 17 years old, when he attacked a supermarket manager with a knife, when he tried to stop him shoplifting, something Griffiths would do regularly. For this incident, Griffiths was sent to prison for three years, and, during this time, he told various professionals, including a probation officer and psychiatrist, that he had fantasised about becoming a serial killer, and believed he would begin killing people before the age of 30 years old. In 1989, at age 19, Griffiths was again back before the court for possession of an offensive weapon, specifically a BB gun, which he would apparently use to shoot birds, which he would then take home and dissect. Just two years later, in 1991, Griffiths was sentenced to two years in prison for holding a knife to a woman's throat. However, I haven't been able to find any information about who this woman was and the particular circumstances. Whilst in prison for this offence, Griffith's mental health was assessed and one doctor described him as, quote, a sadistic, schizoid psychopath. The term schizoid refers to a personality disorder which is characterised by an individual wishing to pursue solitary habits, having difficulty expressing emotions and reacting appropriately to situations and being outwardly humorous emotionally detached and cold to others, so someone who has little vested interest in society. This, coupled with the sadistic and psychopathic labels, indicates that Stephen Griffiths was an individual who had little connection to society, no empathy, remorse or compassion for others, and derived pleasure from inflicting pain and humiliation onto others. And on top of this, his obsession with violence, serial killers and weapons it's clear that this is the profile of a very dangerous man. The authorities agreed, but there was little that could be done. At that point, Griffiths had not done anything which meant they could take any real action against him. However, they knew he was a ticking time bomb. In around 1997, Griffiths moved into Flat 33 at Holmfield Court, a block of flats in Bradford, which is where he will remain until his arrest, and where the CCTV footage I showed at the beginning of this video was captured. Griffiths essentially turned this property into his shrine to murder and violence, adorning the walls with weapons, including samurai swords and crossbows, and amassing hundreds of books about serial killers, as well as violent movies. In 1998, aged 29, Griffiths began dating a woman called Zeta Pinder, who he dated for two years. She later described him as controlling, not letting her go out with her friends, and generally wanted to know where she was at all times. During the relationship, Griffiths told Zeta that he lived with his parents, but she eventually found out that he had a flat and insisted that she went round. When she stepped in, she was disturbed by what she found. She later described coming face to face with his weapons collection and noticing a crossbow simply leaning against the television, as well as hundreds of books on serial killers. Zeta stopped seeing Griffiths soon after this incident. Investigators have speculated that this rejection was what finally led to Griffiths turning his back on the world entirely, as it's clear that he was unable to live a normal life and maintain normal relationships. He therefore appeared to completely disappear into his own world, obsessed with violence and destruction. Added to this, I think this incident would have intensified Griffiths' underlying hatred of women and galvanised his behaviour years later. Griffiths expressed his contempt for society online and hinted at the monster he was, with him using the pseudonym Vampiria and stating, quote, Humanity is not merely a biological condition, it's also a state of mind. On that basis, I am a pseudo-human at best, a demon at worst. Griffiths was known to be eccentric by his neighbours. He would often be seen walking as lizards he owned on Leeds, but he was also known to be rude and aggressive, and he caused significant issues for the other residents. In particular, it seemed he would try to befriend women, but when he made sexual advances towards them, and these were rejected, he had become aggressive 
and threatened to kill or harm them. Police were made aware of these concerns, as well as the fact that Griffiths was seen repeatedly reading books on human dissection. Between 2007 and 2009, the year the murders began, police were receiving ever-increasing levels of complaints about Griffiths' behaviour and demeanour, and on at least one occasion, they seized some weapons from his property. However, they believed there was little they could do, and so the only thing that occurred was that new CCTV cameras were installed with the hope of gathering evidence to evict Griffiths or potentially have him issued with an antisocial behaviour order. These cameras, however, would eventually capture the murder of a young woman and lay bare the depravity of Stephen Griffiths. It should be pointed out that Stephen Griffiths was an intelligent, educated and cunning man. In around 2003, he obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology and, in 2004, enrolled on a part-time PhD course at the University of Bradford, which he was studying when he was eventually arrested. His thesis was going to be on 19th century murders in the Bradford area, so essentially Griffiths was spending his entire time obsessing over killers and was taking qualifications to be called doctor and become an expert in this field. Anyway, his intelligence is also demonstrated by the planning that Griffiths took before he committed his murders. Firstly, teaching himself human dissection from reading books, but also getting to know his prey, with him starting friendships with sex workers in the local area and often inviting them back to his flat for a drink meaning that, at the time of the murders, he was known within these circles as a friendly, unassuming man. This was clearly the superficial charm associated with Griffith's psychopathy, which hid his true, horrific intent, which became apparent in June 2009, when he put his plan to become a famous serial killer into action. Stephen Griffith's first confirmed victim was Susan Rushworth, who was aged 43 and worked as a prostitute in Bradford to fund her addiction to drugs. However, this was not all she was. This is not what any of his victims were, not even close. With regards to Susan, she was a mother of three children, a grandmother, and she had other family who dearly loved her. She was last seen alive getting off a bus on the 22nd of June 2009 in Bradford Town Centre. What happened to her is only known through Griffith's confession, with him stating that he met her and invited her to his flat later that day. And, when she was in the property, he beat her to death with a hammer and then dismembered her body in the bathtub. He claimed to have eaten parts of Susan's body after cooking them. He then disposed of her body parts, but has never revealed where. Confirmation of Griffith's story came when DNA analysis in his flat found significant blood splatter in the property, which was identified as belonging to Susan. At 10pm on the 26th of April 2010, Griffith's second confirmed victim, 31-year-old Shelley Armitage, was last seen alive working in Rebecca Street in Bradford's Red Light District, close to the city centre. It's assumed that soon after this, Griffiths approached her and invited her back to his flat. When she stepped in, she was attacked, and it's believed that she was killed when Griffiths fired a crossbow bolt into her body, but also potentially stabbed her. Police later recovered horrific video camera footage of Shelley's naked and apparently lifeless body, which had been filled by Griffiths. She had the words, quote, my sex slave daubed in black spray paint on her back. Griffiths was heard in the video chanting, quote, I am them prior. I am the bloodbath artist. Here is a model who's assisting me. Griffiths later claimed he'd cooked and eaten parts of Shelley's body. Griffiths then took Shelley's body to the bathroom and dismembered her dumping her remains of the River Eyre, approximately 40 miles away from the site of the murder. At the end of May 2010, human remains were found in the river and subsequently identified as belonging to Shelley. This included part of her spine, which confirmed that she must be deceased. Her father had to identify his daughter from a screenshot that the police had taken from the video shot by Griffiths, but they were only able to show her face to him due to what he'd done to her body. Heartbreakingly, the family wasn't even able to say a proper goodbye to their daughter, sister and friend as almost none of her remains were recovered and what was found was buried in a child's coffin. The last confirmed victim of Stephen Griffiths was 36-year-old Suzanne Blamires who went missing on the 21st of May 2010. Suzanne was described as bright and articulate by those who knew her and she started to train as a nurse when she left school. 
Unfortunately, she developed issues with alcohol and drugs and turned to prostitution in order to fund her addictions. Suzanne did not have an easy life. In 2011, two men were jailed for viciously assaulting Suzanne in December 2009, just five months before her death. These men attacked her while she was working in the red light district and repeatedly kicked her in the head and body. Her death is the one that was captured in its entirety on CCTV. And obviously, the full footage has not been released, but screenshots of her last moments are available. These show that at 2.30am on Saturday the 22nd of May 2010, Griffiths and Suzanne are caught on CCTV, arriving at his flat and then entering the lift and walking towards his property. These images are haunting as they show the last seconds of Suzanne's life. Within three minutes, Suzanne is captured running away from the flat with Griffiths stood behind her, having armed herself with a crossbow. This horrific image shows the murderous intent in Griffith's face as he chases Suzanne and then fired a crossbow bolt into her head, killing her before dragging her body into his flat. It seems that Griffiths may not have noticed the relatively new CCTV cameras which had captured his every move and, when he saw them, rather than shy away, he used this as an opportunity to show his complete contempt for human life, sticking his finger up whilst holding the murder weapon. Griffiths set about dismembering Suzanne's body and again dumped her remains like rubbish in the river air, but again only small pieces of her body were ever recovered. Griffiths must have known that the CCTV footage would lead to his arrest and, on Monday the 24th of May 2010, after Peter Gee had seen the video, armed police descended on the flat and Griffiths was waiting for them. As he was arrested, he proudly told officers, I've killed a lot more than Suzanne Blamires. I've killed loads. Clearly, in Griffiths' sick mind, the main event was about to begin. He now had a captive audience and was going to get the attention he'd always craved. Stephen Griffiths admitted his crimes immediately and the following clip shows a portion of his interview where the police are trying to establish where he dumped the remains of one of his victims, although it's not clear which one. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? And uh, where a robot, where a computer would put them. Yeah, you know, a rational, emotionless aberration would put it. What? Why did you feel the need to to kill her? someone to kill this I don't know, I don't know. That's like deep issues inside me. So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Well I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. There's so much to unpack here. Part of Stephen Griffith's tone of voice is down to his Yorkshire accent, but it's also clear that he's indifferent to the suffering he's caused. He's almost bored by the interview. I imagine this is because he's having questions fired at him and he's not in control, which is not the sort of attention he wanted. Stephen Griffiths was subsequently charged with three counts of murder and remanded into custody to await his day in court. On the 28th of May 2010, Stephen Griffiths made his first appearance at Bradford Magistrates Court, a formality in the UK for a case such as this, before it's committed to the Crown Court. During these types of hearings, the accused simply confirms their name and their address. When asked his name, Griffiths said, quote, The crossbow cannibal. This invariably caused shock in the court and sickeningly deep distress in the victims' families who were in the court to see the man who killed their loved ones. On the 21st of December 2010, Stephen Griffiths appeared before Mr Justice Oppenshaw at Leeds Crown Court and entered guilty pleas to the murders of Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage and Suzanne Blamires. 
Justice Openshaw stated that Griffiths had committed, quote, wicked and monstrous crimes and stated, quote, the circumstances of these murders are so wicked and monstrous, they leave me in no doubt the defendant should be kept in prison for the rest of his life. He then sentenced him. Stephen Griffiths was sentenced to a whole life order, meaning that he will never be released from prison. I'm tempted to refer to Stephen Griffiths as a pathetic, attention-seeking loser, and, whilst this is not very professional or a clinical description, I believe it's accurate. I've already given some of my thoughts about him, in that I think that his troubled childhood led him to developing a hatred of women, specifically prostitutes, and, whilst he appeared to have contempt for society as a whole, these individuals represented, in his mind, an even lower form of life. Killing them served two purposes. First, it eradicated these type of people from society, but also gave him the attention he desperately craved, with him inevitably fantasising about receiving the same notoriety as the serial killers he idolised. However, I don't believe that Griffiths was a cannibal. I've not seen any evidence, i.e. forensics of kitchen utensils, etc., which should indicate that this was true. Instead, I think it's interesting that Chaig, the acid murderer who went to the same school as Griffiths, made similar claims after his arrest, with him stating that he'd drunk the blood of his victims. He later admitted this was a lie. I think that he was trying to set up a defence of insanity to avoid the hangman. That one didn't work also to shock others and revel in his crimes. I think the same is true of Griffiths. Calling himself a cannibal was his way of shocking people, gaining notoriety and making himself feel big and powerful, whilst also compounding the horror that his victims' poor families had to endure. However, recognition and attention only last so long, and it's reported that Stephen Griffiths has attempted suicide on repeated occasions since his imprisonment, including going on a 120-day hunger strike in 2011. It appears that Griffiths would act in this manner when other high-profile prisoners were getting attention in the press, so he clearly was desperate to refocus attention to himself. Griffiths was also attacked in prison in 2019, during which a prisoner stabbed him in the chest with a wooden spear they'd made. If that's not poetic justice, I'm not sure what is. Stephen Griffiths is currently 53 years old, and will spend the rest of his miserable life in prison, which is exactly what he deserves, hopefully slipping into obscurity and eventually nothingness. The women he killed are, unfortunately, defined by their profession in the press, which really irks me. It took me a lot of research to find information about them outside of this, but they were mothers, daughters, sisters, grandmothers and friends to people who loved them and who mourned their passing. They know we had aspirations to their life, but fell on hard times and were forced to make decisions which I imagine they hated, but saw that they had no choice. They were human beings who did not deserve to have their lives ended in such a horrific manner. Their names again were Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage and Suzanne Blamires. These women deserve to be remembered. Their lives mattered. And I hope they rest in peace. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Had you heard about the crimes of Stephen Griffiths? I just wanted to say, you can now become a channel member, you get a cool little icon and early access to videos, but, more importantly, you help support me work towards spending more time doing this, which I really enjoy. Also, if you like the video, you can send me a super thanks. However, don't feel obligated to do either, just as long as you enjoy the content. Anyway. Thank you for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.